Good morning everyone and welcome to this 15,000 mile Polestar review. I've had my Polestar for a year now and I got it in, uh, it's just over a year in fact, October last year. And uh, the, let's see, we're looking at 14,788 miles as I'm speaking. So we're almost at 15,000 miles. So I'm going to call it the 15,000 mile review. Uh, yeah, so in this video, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually driving up to London today. So I'm going to combine this with a, a nice range test. The temperature is dropping. It's eight degrees today. And uh, it'll just be nice to see what kind of range consumption figures I get because the last time I did uh, any kind of range testing, I think was probably in the winter last year. And it will be nice to see if the software updates, anything has changed to see any kind of noticeable difference. So I'm going to combine the range test with this 15,000 mile review. And I have a list of things that I'm going to talk about. So these include, and I'm just looking down at my list here so I don't forget, looks and styling of the car, performance, the functionality of the Android tablet system, over the air update space and practicality problems with the car range and the customer support and then a summary at the end it might not be exactly in that order but those are the things I'm going to cover in this video so stick around and hopefully this will be a really informative and useful 15,000 mile Polestar 2 review so let's have a look at the route we're going to take today I will show you Google Maps and let's see what kind of estimates it's giving Okay, so I'm on the maps page here and it's saying one hour and 37 minutes. That is a long time to get to. <laughs> well, that's the problem with driving into London. 61 miles, 57% on arrival. So let's hit start and uh, let's see what we're going to get on this display over here. So move over here and look, you can see. Yeah, there's congestion. We know that. Okay, thanks for the update, Google. And there we go. You can see this uh, limitation here on the uh, the regen because of the 90% battery and possibly a combination of temperature as well. But if we go onto this page here, interesting to see there, 33.1 kilowatt hours per hundred miles over the last 4,900 miles. That's actually really good consumption. But a lot of that comes from the tail end of the summer when the weather was really good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset that. Um, I had that there for a long time and now we've got a fresh trip manual to have a look at on this uh, route today. So let's head off. So the first thing I want to talk about in the Polestar that I think drew me to the car initially are the looks and styling of this car. Before it was uh, available in the UK, there'd been a lot of information on the internet, some ads on TV, things like that. But what always drew my, me to the car was, was the looks, the design and the styling of this, this car. It is unique. There isn't really anything else on the road, I think, that looks like this car. Um, all too often we find that I think cars can be quite samey. They look quite similar in styling and design. But Polestar have really come up with something that looks quite different. And I, even though I've had this car for over a year now and there are a lot more of these on the road, it still does seem to um, attract a lot of looks from, from people when you drive past, people that will look at the car in car parks, even, even people who will ask questions uh, and, and say, what is that? I, I haven't seen that before. That's an unusual looking car. Now, with an unusual looking car obviously comes the downside that perhaps you don't like the styling. Not everybody does because when you're kind of a bit bold and ambitious, there are always going to be people that do or don't like the design approach that you take. But um, I definitely think that, that there are certain aspects about the Polestar that, that do look very good. Um, these, these wing mirrors, for example, are, are, are a really nice piece of design that, uh, that look fantastic. The headlights look really good. The, the lights at the back, I think, are particularly uh, cool in the way that they sort of they light up and they open up when you unlock the car and they close down when you relock the car. Uh, there's there's no doubt that there's lots of nice little touches that are sort of very futuristic, but some also classic designs. Um, but beyond just looks and styling, there are a few things that I think are really really clever. So the the side doors. If you look at the doors on the car, it's a big sort of bulky, beefy looking car, and 
the side doors are actually really cleverly shaped and designed. That This happened to me at home the other day. One of my, my driveway gates blew open in the wind and it knocked into the car and I thought, oh great, that's gonna have left a dent. When I got out of the car, I realized that the way that the door is sloped and curved actually means that the, the gate had not made contact with the side of the door where you would see it if it had made a dent, but it made contact with the bottom edge of the, of, of the vehicle and just at the bottom of the door, which is actually plastic lined and it had left no mark. So not only is the styling very well considered in terms of what it looks like, but they've also thought out some of these styling designs. And I, and I very much doubt that's an accident, but I thought that was great that, you know, if, if a door blows open or knocks into your car, then actually the first point of contact it makes is not the top edge of the door and leaves a big dent, but it's actually the bottom edge of the car. And that is very, very cool. Styling of the interior, well, I think I'm going to talk a little bit later about the interior because it, it, it overlaps into various things, including the Android tablet, as well as storage and practicality. But the interior of the car, again, it's a love or hate kind of styling. I think it looks absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I love the, the lines, the shapes, the materials that they've used, the way that it lights up inside. The only things that I would say that they could have given us that might have made things a little bit better than they already are is uh, the option to change the color of the lights like you're just left with one white option and I get that that's that's Polestar's choice that that's the way they want the car to look but uh, on a, the previous BMW I had I actually had a choice of colors and I thought that was quite nice it wasn't a wide range of choice it was just a sort of an orange or a white but even in the Polestar that would be nice and there's no reason I guess why they couldn't have gone a step further and offered the option to choose even more range of, of color colors, it might go against the styling and design choice. I, I totally understand that. But what would have been nice is a little bit more control over things like that, especially as it all goes through this, uh, the tablet system in the middle. But that actually is part of the design and styling that I think is great. I, I really like the, the tablet system in the middle and the, the gear selector console bit that runs down the center of the car. Now, this comes more into sort of storage and practicality, but there are a lot of people who don't like that element of the car because what it does is it creates this sort of solid middle section that you might knock your knee into. And I've seen that in some of the other reviews where people have complained about knocking their knee into this. Now, I would just simply say, I don't find that a problem at all. What I do is I just rest my knee on that. I don't bash my knee into the middle because I don't tend to, well, I don't see any reason why I would swing my knee around while I'm driving. I use it as a nice comfortable rest for the left leg that can lean up against this however if you drive something like a like a Tesla Model 3 or this isn't really a comparison the Kia Soul these are really nice electric cars they have a lot more space in the center and it can create this sense of spaciousness within the car um, that the Polestar doesn't have the Polestar has a more sort of keep you enclosed and protected and comfortable kind of feel to it which is part of their design and styling approach. So it, it's, again, this is something that, you know, if you test drive the car, you will experience and you'll see what I'm talking about. But it's something to consider because it's not necessarily for everybody. I really like it, but um, I can see why some people might not like the the, the design and styling that is, is created to sort of keep you, you enclosed in this little capsule inside your car. So next up on my list, I want to talk about performance, handling, and just the general driving experience of the Polestar 2. This car, you've got to remember if you're watching this review, is the uh, original model that was released in 2020, uh, which was last year. I got this car in October. So since then, in 2021, there are other models available with different uh, power configurations and different uh, different options. At the initial launch of the car, there was just one version and it has this glass roof behind me. Um, and it also has, uh, it's, it's about 400, 404 horsepower, something like that. So if you uh, bear that in mind when you're watching this video, um, it applies only to this particular car. When I talk about performance, that's quite relevant because this is a powerful car. 400 horsepower is, th that is a lot. I mean, before that I had, I've had a couple of cars that have been pretty decent. I had a BMW 3, 3 30D, uh, uh, 535D. Um, actually, I think it was a 335D. But my point there is they had around the 300, 320 horsepower kind of range, a lot of torque. 
but of course it came from a twin turbo diesel engine, small turbo, large turbo, and uh, really good gearboxes. They always felt very powerful, very strong cars that were, they rarely, when you, when you put your foot down, especially if you were at 30 miles an hour up to sort of 70, that torque was, was so useful. But when you get into a car like the Polestar, that's a distant memory. Those cars don't matter as far as I'm concerned. They might because a lot of people are driving them, so please don't take offense. But what I'm trying to say here is you get instantaneous torque and power from a car like the Polestar and there is a lot of it. It's spread across all four wheels, so the stability of the car when you put your foot down is pretty phenomenal. Now, um, the the Tesla Model 3 performance is obviously more powerful. Um, it's 0 to 60 times quicker. I haven't had a chance to drive that car. I did have a Tesla Model 3 long range for a, a weekend earlier on. I think it was, yeah, it was earlier on in the year. And that is a really, really powerful car with superb performance. And if, if I'm honest, you know, that really, really does go. And it's very, very aggressive. Um, but the Polestar is very similar in terms of performance to that particular car. And when you put your foot down at a set of traffic lights, if you're at the front and you're in an area where you can legally accelerate from zero to 70 miles an hour, if you put your foot down, the, the torque and the power throws you back into your seat and it is it's quite a phenomenal experience it feels a little bit more like being on a, a roller coaster that does a 0 to sort of 70 0 to 100 mile an hour start in a few seconds because it, it there is no lag there's no changing of gears you don't hear anything either other than the 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 whine of the electric motors as they spool up in a diesel car or a petrol car that's powerful, you will feel and you will anticipate those gear changes. So you get a more engaged kind of experience, which a lot of purist drivers will much prefer over the Polestar. But all of those kinds of the, the, the noise that you hear, the gear changes, that kind of thing, it actually almost takes away some of the shock of the acceleration that you get in an electric car because it just launches itself. And that, that is something that I just don't get bored of. Um, I have have kids and they absolutely love it. I mean, I have to warn them if I'm gonna do it because if they're, if they're sort of playing with toys or they're, they're next to the side, it does, it throws your neck back quite aggressively and they much prefer it if I, I warn them that I'm gonna use the power um, and put my foot down. Now, the way in which Polestar have designed the car, I think, is the accelerator is very forgiving. So when you when you drive normally, you don't feel any kind of excessive launch, excessive sort of jerkiness of the car. It's very, very smooth, but that power is all available to you. But it's sort of, it's like they've allocated it to the back end of the, uh, the accelerator pedal. So when you put your foot down past the 50% mark, then you start to get into that area where it's taking advantage of all that power. In the Kia e Soul, it's a lot easier to find yourself sort of jerking the, the, the accelerator pedal a little bit um, because what you end up, the, the, the first sort of 20% of the pedal is actually quite a lot of power and it's quite responsive. So if you, you tap it gently, you, you sort of spring forwards, which can be a little bit uncomfortable, but the Polestar doesn't do that. That first 20, 30% of the pedal is very, very smooth and very gentle, makes for a very easy driving experience. So tied in with performance obviously is the handling element of the car because the two really do go hand in hand and without really good handling I think the performance is wasted in any car and that's one thing that actually BMWs are really good for is that the handling characteristics are, are great. The, the Polestar though I would say is for me really really good. I'm not someone who drives the car like a, a race car driver. I don't go to track days or anything like that. So I am driving the car in a real world scenario. And and a lot of the driving I end up doing is on uh, A and B roads in the UK and some of those are small country lanes where the road can be quite twisty, quite bendy and you do get an opportunity to enjoy the good quality handling of a car or in fact experience how bad the handling is of certain cars. Now I don't want this to be uh, a Polestar versus 
versus Tesla kind of review, that's not really what I'm aiming at. But I'm trying to sort of draw some comparisons between cars that I've experienced to give you an idea of what the Pulse does like. So you have um, limited control over your performance and your handling within the main drive page on the screen that you can see here you have the opportunity to change the steering feel from light to standard to firm. Now, I don't really find that that makes much of a difference for me. I prefer to just drive on standard. Firm I thought was a little firm, light was a little too light. So I just leave it on standard. Um, and then down at the bottom you've got your creep on and off and that affects your start and stop. I leave it off so I like the car to come to a halt and just stop rather than sort of creep forwards like like you might do um, in uh, in a car, I guess a petrol car if you took your foot or a diesel car if you put your took your foot off the, the brake pedal it could creep forward um, and then you've got the one pedal driving off low and standard that that sort of links in a little bit more to regenerative braking and energy consumption but it also affects the driving feel of the car now I like to set mine on low so it means that as soon as I take my foot off the accelerator the car does start to slow down but it does so fairly gently without being too aggressive to the passengers or too harsh if you set it to uh, one pedal driving standard that um, that's much more aggressive in terms of the way it slows down. So you have to ease your foot off the accelerator rather than, you can't just really take your foot off and coast because the coasting is quite harsh and I think uh, passengers in the car find that a little bit uncomfortable. But it's all down to your own personal driving style. But that's all you can control in the car. There are no fancy options of, of controlling, you know, well, I say fancy, but like even a lot of more affordable cars have it. But you can't really control, there's no eco mode, there's no way of like reducing or limiting your performance. And actually, I really like that because Polestar have just thought, you know what, we want this to be a driving car for people to enjoy and drive. If we start putting eco and eco plus modes, people will start driving like that. And then it takes away the enjoyment of the car. You can choose to drive um, as, as economically as you like, 50 miles an hour on a motorway if you want. But it, it, the car itself does doesn't have the features and options to do that and sometimes a less is more approach is really really good because that's what you get with a Polestar. Now in terms of handling I think the handling is really really good. The Tesla Model 3 does not handle anywhere near as well as the Polestar and that I think I'd be really surprised I mean obviously you can leave comments down below feel free but I would be a little surprised if anyone who has driven both for at least a couple of days would find that the Tesla Model 3 long range handles better. The performance may be that's a different story. What I mean by this is I think that the Polestar has the right balance between comfort and stability on the road. It is very, very stable with a low center of gravity. It's quite a heavy car, um, but but you feel engaged and linked in with the steering wheel and, and the, the way that the car is handling on the road at all times. There isn't as much feedback as you get on a BMW where you can really feel the road through the steering wheel. In the Polestar, when you hit a bump, sometimes you don't even notice it in the steering wheel. You feel it in the body of the car, but you don't feel it through the steering wheel. And for some people that might not be great, but for me, it doesn't really matter too much. It, it makes for a comfortable way to drive. But the Tesla I found, um, Although the, the handling, perhaps the, the feel of the road through the steering wheel is absolutely fine, the balance between the firmness on the road and the way that which the car handles wasn't as good as it is on the Polestar. And that uh, uh, that's just my opinion, but I think most people would agree if you've driven the two. The Polestar have got that balance just right and I think that makes for a very enjoyable driving experience when you're on the motorway when you're on a roads b roads country lanes because the car has been configured really well to deal with both styles of driving and all kinds of different road surfaces now tied in with the handling on the road is the wind noise now Tesla again I'm using the same comparison have made lots of changes to the cars over time so it's not really always fair to make these types of comparisons but the interior noise in the Polestar 2 is very well controlled the noise from the road is it, it, it's really really quiet that's all I can say and the wind noise is well controlled too so if you have any concerns over noise the Polestar 2 that that is not one to be concerned about when I did the uh, comparison between the Polestar and the Tesla the Tesla was noisier I used a decibel meter and it didn't come out as quiet or as comfortable inside the car in my personal opinion so yeah I mean just to summarize the performance of the Polestar 2 is exceptional it, it's not the quickest electric car 0 to 60 you can definitely get a lot quicker and that is another area where Tesla have done very well but the Polestar's combination of 
excellent handling comfort on the road and really really good performance and the way in which it's it's set up through the pedal i think is is superb and i thoroughly enjoyed driving the car partly for that reason over the last 15,000 miles In this section I want to talk a bit about the storage and practicality in the Polestar 2. One of the, uh, again, another feature that really attracted me to this car was that it's a, it's a hatchback style car, so the boot opening looked like it would be really good and really spacious. I didn't see the car before I ordered one on a lease, so that was a bit of a risky move, um, but I kind of took a leap of faith and thought, yeah, this is going to be big enough with enough space in it. And that is one of the key things that, that I thought was great about the Polestar, is the way that the boot opens. So you can open up the boot, you can take the parcel shelf out, you can fold down the seats like you can see in all of these shots. And it's a, a really spacious car, very easy to transport things in, and uh, big enough for a, a family of four to go on holiday. Um, the boot opening is really big and spacious. There's plenty of room in the boot itself and then there's also a floor that you can lift up and then there's other a little bit of space underneath. In addition to the boot you've got the uh, the front section, the fruit or the frunk or whatever people like to call it. That has a little bit of storage space but there's not much you can fit in there. I mean I use that for cable storage. I think that's what most people do. You can fit, a, it stays nice and cool so you can put some drinks in there or some food, maybe even a small backpack. But it is a nice little extra bit of storage space. Now the only thing that I would say that perhaps isn't the best thing about the car is that when I saw pictures of it, it looked really big and the car does feel like a big car it's not excessively big for uk uk roads or uk parking spaces but um i'd say from the outside the car looks bigger than perhaps it is on the inside the boot is definitely big enough it fits all the kind of stuff that we'd need for a holiday we took the car up to the lake district and back from Sussex which was over a thousand miles of driving and that was for just over a week and we were easily able to fit everything that we needed into the car no, no problems at all when I tried to load my our sort of usual holiday stuff into the Tesla Model 3 it was a little bit more of a challenge because it is a saloon style car with a boot opening that isn't quite as tall so when you're trying to stack things in then you you might not be able to fit them in however the Tesla Model 3's boot actually feels massive it feels really spacious so if you have the right combination of things you might actually prefer that style of, of boot so i would say yeah the polestar's boot space and general in interior storage is, is absolutely fine it's not a massive car though that's something you need to bear in mind if you're buying this for a family of four then you're probably going to be absolutely fine fitting what you need into the car but if you've got a family of five and you want to have three children on the back seat that is going to be more difficult because you've got this bump in the middle which you don't have in a lot of other electric cars the mitsubishi outlander phev the tesla model 3 the kia e soul they all are flat across the back now yeah this it is partly because the polestar platform that it's designed on that's that's the reason why that bump is there and i'm sure they put it to good use i imagine there might be some battery storage or something like that i don't know but it, it's kind of annoying because you if you're sitting a person in the middle there they've got to sit with their their feet on either side of this bump which makes it feel more claustrophobic for them the boot space is probably okay but yeah it, it, in my personal opinion it's only just enough really for me and a family of two children if they did like a slightly bigger or an estate version of this car, I mean, I think it, it might look really weird for one thing, but that extra storage space would be really, really useful. I think just a little bit of extra space in this car would, would really make a big difference. Now, in terms of space as a driver or as a passenger, there's a good amount of space, but again, this is not the winning feature of the Polestar. The uh, Tesla Model 3, again, has much more space inside, I'd say. Much more storage, little compartments. All of the storage spaces available in the Polestar are fairly compact. Here in the middle, you've got uh, a center armrest that lifts up, and you've got 
cup holders, but that you can only really use one of them because the other one's inside the armrest. It's so small that you can only fit a really small drink in there. This one kind of, it's fine. I use it all the time and I have no issues, but it gets in the way of your arm. You do then have the option to store a bottle on the side, inside the door, and just your left knee, you have a really useful little compartment there for sunglasses or for something else that you might want to store in that space. So it's absolutely fine, perfectly adequate, center armrest at the back. And one thing that I really like, and actually this is a huge thing for me, is that when you fold down that center armrest, you can, you can put something that's long through the, the back from the boot into the cabin. Now, I don't know if you can see it in any of the shots, but I've actually got fishing rods here. I drive around at the moment with uh, usually two or three fishing rods in the car, just in case I get a chance to go fishing somewhere. And uh, if I didn't have that, um, option of, of running that through from the boot into the car, I'd have to fold those rods down every single time. So if you ever have to carry something longer, then that is an excellent feature. Um, and it's, it's found in many, many cars, but it's something that I just, I feel like if it didn't have it, it would be a massive inconvenience. Um, but other than that, yeah, storage and practicality of the car is good. It's not something that I would say is exceptional, but perfectly adequate. So I want to talk a little bit about over the air updates. And uh, if you've watched my other videos, then you'll have seen this subject come up a lot. OTA is the abbreviation that they seem to like to use for over-the-air updates. And it's um, something that has become more common uh, over the last couple of years, but it's still, to be honest, in its infancy, really, within the car industry. Tesla were one of the pioneers with the over-the-air updating functionality. And I guess when they were designing the car, they thought, well, how would we approach this if we uh, were, were designing a computer or a tablet device, a bit like uh, Apple or Microsoft, Sony, OnePlus, any of those manufacturers. And of course, we don't take the phone or the tablet or the computer back to the, uh, to the manufacturer for updates. We don't wait for a disc to be sent to us anymore, a USB stick, a floppy disk, any of those things it's sent to your device via the internet and it runs an update and you get lots of new features and everyone's happy. So that started to creep into the automotive industry and into the car industry and for manufacturers to think, oh, how can we implement that same design philosophy that will allow us to improve and change things over time? So. It, it allows the makers to create a roadmap. They can release a vehicle, a car, and, and it will have its functionality, but they can have ideas in, their, in their, the back, back of their mind, concepts for later, things that they can improve on. But by designing the software and the hardware and the onboard computers so that they can take advantage of that kind of updating system, it means that the manufacturer can improve and tweak the car over time, which it does two things. It keeps the customer very, very happy, and hopefully loyal customers mean that they're more likely to come back to the brand in the future. But it also means that the manufacturer can improve on the vehicle and hopefully reduce the amount of visits that the, uh, the owner of the car needs to make to go back to the service center, which uh, ultimately reduces cost. Uh, and that is a, a money-saving exercise on a long-term basis. So. Polestar initially released the car without the over-the-air update functionality. And when I, when I got the car, I can't remember when it was, but a few months into the experience, I had to go back to Volvo and they installed an update that would enable it to update over the air in the future. So if you are getting a car now, then that isn't relevant to you. But it didn't come with that functionality to start and they were very honest but that was sorted out quite quickly. Once that was done, I'd say every few months, it's not too often, it's, it's every few months, Polestar have released new updates that have unlocked new features and have made improvements that so, some of them are, are improvements that you can physically see and others are improvements that you can't. So one good example is uh, the car initially didn't show you good information on your charging speed. So you could be on a, on a rapid charger and you, you didn't know what, what speed your, your car was actually charging at. So many users asked for that to be added as a feature. 
and it didn't actually take Pulsar very long, maybe eight months before that was added, thrown over the update. But they've, they've done even more significant stuff, more than just what you as a driver can see. Behind the scenes things, including um, improvements on battery heating technology, the way in which regenerative braking works. And those types of updates are actually really, really interesting because it, it means that the, the manufacturer can evolve your car over time. Obviously, it will get to a point where that can't be done anymore and, and you know, new cars and new technology will come out. But it's, it's really cool having a car that the manufacturer can gather data from all those cars around the world and look at things that they can tweak and improve through software updating. And that software updating process is actually very simple. All that will happen is at some point, it will tell you via the tablet that you have a software update available to install. And it will warn you that you need to allocate, I think it's an hour and a half to the updating process. So you just simply wait till you're in a good position. I mean, I don't do it while I'm out because I uh, there have been examples where people have updated their car and it's actually caused a significant problem where they've had to have it towed and taken back to Volvo to be looked at. So I tend to do it when I'm at home because at least I know that if it causes some major issue I'm not stranded somewhere but once it's installed that's it and you can look in the user manual or on the website and find out exactly what's changed and what's been improved um, and in addition to the OTA over the air updates you actually also get Google's own updating via the uh, Google Maps for example can update itself regardless of all of that so that runs different to the OTA updates that we talk about that's something that Polestar deal with and there's you know that's complex software but then this android tablet system that can also uh, update the the app for example there could be a new version of an app that comes out that you can install and update and google maps will will add and move stuff so in fact they've moved things around quite a bit since i've had this car they've obviously looked at it and thought and got feedback and thought actually it makes more sense to have that in this position and something else in another position. So that's another very useful functionality um, that they've added. So I just want to point out one of the apps that I think that is quite important is this range assist. I think they got lots of feedback from customers um, who mentioned that, that there wasn't much information in terms of range or what's actually going on in the car. So they added this range assist app uh, and I think that's really good. I'll talk about that a bit more in, in the range uh, section of this uh, video, but being able to release new apps that are useful to the driver are one of the, the great features of these over-the-air updates. Okay, so we've arrived here at a destination in London, and let's have a look at the consumption and the range information that we've, we've had on this drive today. So just looking at the display here, it's showing 61 miles, 32.1 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. So what does that mean in the real sense of the range? So I don't know if you recall, but at the beginning of the video, it said we were going to arrive here with 57%. We actually arrived with 62% battery level, which is great. So that means we beat that by uh, 5% and 32.1 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. I think that's actually really good. So let's convert that to total range. If you assume 75 kilowatt uh, hours is the battery capacity of the car, divide that by 32.1 and you get 233 miles. So that's basically saying, uh, according to the trip computer, we have a theoretical range on a drive like today where the temperature was about eight, nine degrees of 233 miles. The other way of trying to calculate the theoretical range is to look at how far we drove in terms of percentage. So I know this gets a little over complicated, so don't worry too much about it. Um, but basically we started with 90% this morning and we got here with 62% remaining. So if you take that and you convert that to a distance per percent, we get 200, uh, sorry, we get 2.17 miles per percent of battery times that by 100 and you get 217 miles. So there's two different ways of trying to calculate the theoretical range. You can use the trip computer or you can use a percentage-based method like that. Both a little over the top. It depends whether you like working that kind of thing out or not. But essentially, we get anything from 217 to 233 miles. So around the 220 to 230 mile range uh, is basically what we've got today. Now, another thing I want to show you is over here on the range assistant. So right now, the range assistant is showing a projected range of 140 miles and the range over there on this display is 150. So you get a different number depending on which thing you look at. Now, the range assistant over here is based on a dynamic calculation 
uh, of how you've been driving. But 140 miles based on 62%. So if we take 140 divided by 62, we get 2.25, and I'll show you my calculator down here. Uh, too much glare, in fact. We get 2.25 miles per percent. So it shows that the range assistant of the, the car is, is, is basically yeah, it's in line with what we're actually experiencing when we're driving. So again, if I do that by 100, theoretical range of 225 miles. So what I'm trying to prove here is the drive today has given us a theoretical range of around 220 to 230 miles. And this range assistant app that they've added to the Polestar is rarely accurate and gives some really good range data that is dynamic and a much better way of figuring out what you've got left than the range display that you see on the main screen of the Polestar, which is based on just a fixed number. And it doesn't change based on your own driving style.